Good morning. Good morning. A trumpet sound right now would be great timing. <laughs> well, let's pray. Lord, we humbly come before you this morning, man, to praise and worship you, to seek your word, your direction, and guidance. Help us now to just surrender ourselves, all the noise from this world. Just prepare our minds, our hearts, and help us to receive from you this morning what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, we come to the end of the book of Romans. What a journey, right? It was one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's loaded with good stuff. Um, so I wanted to quickly recap uh, the book of Romans, and I was thinking, eh, what's the best way of, of doing that? And I thought, well, you know, like TV series, you know how they do it, right? They, they'll show all the main clips of the past episodes, and it kind of gets you caught up for the ending, the grand finale, if you will. So I thought we can do that this morning, but instead of uh, video clips, um, we're going to use some uh, Bible verses, Bible clips, okay? So, um, we're, so the book of Romans starts at chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 1 through chapter 3, is really about, Paul, Paul was showing us about the people's lack of God's righteousness because of our sin. So you'll see a lot of that in those three uh, chapters, and the verse that I pulled out of that was Romans chapter 3, verse 23, where it said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then we move from, uh, from there, we go to chapters 4 through 5, and the letter talks about uh, a, how a believer receives God's righteousness through faith. In the, in the verse there that really spoke in those chapters, um, for me, was Romans chapter 5, verse 8, where it said, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then we move into the book, and we go through chapters 6 through 8, where we see how God demonstrates his righteousness by transforming us. God changing us, right, from a rebel to a follower, from being lost to being found, from being spiritually dead to now being spiritually alive. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 23 there's a verse that says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then we move into Romans chapter 9 through 11, and we saw how God confirming his righteousness in salvation. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a promise. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth uh, uh, confession is made unto salvation. And then we get to chapters 12 through 15, and what we see, we see more of the practical application of his righteousness throughout our lives. And in the, the, the verse there for, for me was in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and it said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's just rich of amazing um, things of God for us. And then today, this morning, we pick it up in Romans chapter 16. And I've got to admit, when Pastor Brian asked me um, to do this chapter, I thought, I can't do the grand finale of the book. You, you've done so much work and so much time, and I, you're just going to hand over the, the grand finale of the whole thing? 
Um, so then I couldn't help myself, so I peeked. What, what, is, what is in chapter uh, 16? And I, and I peeked in there, and I saw that it was mostly names. In fact, there was like 33 names in the first 24 verses. So I figured, Pastor Brian wants me to cover the credits, like, a, like at the end of a movie. And, but I, you know, I'm guilty of thinking that way when it comes to a list of names, I, I've got to admit, or genealogies, as you go working through yourself through the Bible. When you get to those chapters, you're just kind of like, all right, you know? <laughs> Um, but there's so much there sometimes, most of the time, if you take your time in there. You, we can miss a lot if we're not careful. For instance, this list that we have this morning, this is the church. It's the church. I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about something you find on Zillow. It's a group of people who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is you and me, right? It's a spiritual family. We just happened to all of us agreed to meet in this building this morning. The church agreed to meet here in this building this morning. Sometimes we meet at a park. I know some that are meeting at a school this morning right now. Um, sometimes at people's homes. In fact, the early churches were filled like that. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, he said, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in, I am there in the midst of them. That's church. We're church. Now this word church is used in the New Testament over 100 times. In the Greek, it's ekklesia. It's a compound word. It's made up of two words. One is called, and another word is out. Called out. That's what it means. And the first time this word is used in the New Testament was from Jesus himself. In Matthew 16, 1, remember when he told, G when he told Peter, and I also say to you um, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, ecclesia, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So, here, we will have a gathering of what? Called out people that Jesus calls the church. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it tells us, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Holy means what? Set apart. A set apart calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ uh, Jesus before time began. Check that out. This was planned from the beginning. And once again, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you, meaning us, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, um, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who what? called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Don't miss those key references of what the church is. God chose us before time began. God called us out of the world. He saved us. God set us apart for his special purpose. Well, what is that special purpose? To proclaim his praise to share what he has done, to share who he is, to point to the lost world, to point to the lost out of darkness toward the light. And that's who we join right now in Romans chapter 16. So let's rejoin Paul in Romans 16 as he greets this gathering of believers that are in Rome right now. And we start in Romans 16, verse 1. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Crintia, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. So we're introduced to a woman named Phoebe. Her name means 
bright and radiant. And according to how Paul's speaking of her, it seems that her name fits her personality. I mean, he calls her a sister, meaning a part of God's family. He says she's a servant or a deacon, deaconess, for a, uh, you know, uh, for a girl. And, and it's meaning she's completely surrendered to the will of God. We're told that Phoebe not only helped Paul, but she served others too. Paul tells us she's worthy. And he encourages the rest of the church to assist her in any way and in anything she needs. Phoebe has been given great responsibility to deliver this letter, the book of Romans. At this moment, there's only one. I'm glad she made it. It's a great book, you know. Well, and we're also told she's from uh, Centria. That's a neighboring port city of Corinth. And Corinth is where Paul was writing this. So it makes sense, right? On a side note, what you're going to see here in, uh, in this chapter, it's going to be hard not to be impressed by the number of women Paul mentions in this chapter. We know that the early church, women had many responsibilities. They instructed other women. They instructed children. They cared for the sick, the poor, the strangers, and even those in prison. We're going to see a lot of that. In Romans um, chapter 16, look at verse 3. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentile." Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinitus, who is the first fruit of Ahia to Christ. So Paul begins his greetings with Priscilla and Aquila, a, a, a husband and wife team ministering together. And they have opened their home in Rome for this church to gather. Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned six times in the New Testament. But the first time we are introduced to them is actually in the book of Acts, chapter 18. In Acts 18, verse 1, it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them, so because... Uh, He was of the same trade. He stayed with them and worked for the occupation. They were tent makers. That's how they met. So when Paul first came to Corinth, he was introduced to Aquila and Priscilla, his wife Priscilla. They opened their home to Paul. They worked together. They were all in the same trade, right? They were making tents. They became close friends. They traveled together. They ministered together. They even were putting their own lives on the line, it said, for one another. Now, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, they have a special place in my heart. I, too, have been blessed to be able to do a lot of ministry with my wife. Children's ministry, home fellowships, various other opportunities. It's awesome. It's a blessing. Um, I'm also blessed to see many Aquilas and Priscillas here in in this fellowship. I love that. It's a wonderful blessing to see. They say a couple that serves together stays together. <laughs> Next, we're introduced to Epinatus. We're told that he was the first fruit of Ahia to Christ, which means he was the first convert of Paul in the province of Asia. That's where Ephesus was the capital of. He was the first one to believe the gospel to become born again for that area. Isn't that amazing? You know, and there are those times, right? Those certain days that are very special in our lives. Um, Those days that you remember where you were, what you were doing, the exact time. Ironically, today is one of those days, isn't it? With 9-11. And for Epinatus and Paul, it represents one of those moments for them. They remember exactly you know, and he's bringing that up. He's just pointing that out. 
And then in Romans 16, 6, we continue. He says, greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Adronicus and Junia and my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are, um, uh, who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. So Paul now greets a woman named Mary, not too much known as, uh, a, we don't know too much about her, uh, no mention of a husband. Is she single? Is she a widow? We don't know. But we are told that she labored much. She had the gift of help, right? She is that person who's always in the background, you know, filling the gaps, picking up the slack. How can I help? How can I serve, right? And then we come to Adronicus and Junia, perhaps another married couple, maybe siblings. I'd lean towards, I think it's a married couple. But Paul, Paul calls them a countryman. Most likely, um, they're from the tribe of Benjamin as Paul. But this is the point I want, uh, I want you to see. Paul also says that they were fellow prisoners. It seemed that they were imprisoned together for preaching the gospel. And unfortunately, this isn't something of the past that we're reading about. Christian church today is under great persecution around the world. According to the 2022 World Watch List, there are more than 65 countries today where Christians are persecuted around the world right now. That accounts for approximately 360 million Christians suffering through that persecution. One in seven of all believers, that's what it comes down to. So far, check this out, year to date, 2022, 6,000, over 6,000 Christians have been killed for their faith. Over 5,000 churches and other children buildings have been attacked. Over 4,700 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. Now, even in America, we see the tide turning against Christianity. I mean, they may not be feeding us to the lions right now, yet. But there is no doubt we are facing more hostility, more ill treatment for our faith. And I believe we'll see more and more of this in the coming days. But it shouldn't surprise us. Paul told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, he says, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in, at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and, and, and of them all, all the Lord has delivered me. And then look what he says in verse 12. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And as we see our society begin to turn more and more against what the word of God stands for, it's only a matter of time that every believer, at one point or another, will have to pick a side. Will you remain loyal to the one who is loyal to you? Now, for Adronicus and Junia, it was yes. They decided if Jesus is willing to go to the grave for me, I'm willing to go to the pen for him, right? And then in verse 8, we continue. Paul says, greet um, Amplius, my beloved in the Lord, and greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Here we're introduced to three different men. We don't know too much about them, but we believe that these, that these are all nicknames, which many times, nicknames, what? Reveal a lot about a person at times. Now, first one, we have urbanus, which means city bread, right? It's where we get the name urban. So most likely a city dweller. He's recognized as a fellow worker. And then we have umplius which was a very common slave name in Rome. And then lastly, Stachys, 
whose name actually has been listed with the imperial household. Now, don't miss the picture here. This picture of three men and what they represent. Three different um, statuses of life. A slave, an ordinary blue-collar city dweller, and one of higher status. And in the world, these three lives most likely would not have much in common with one another. Their, their paths probably didn't cross a lot. They probably wouldn't have been friends. But isn't it amazing what happens when we come to the Lord? There's a, a oneness that forms. It's like we're spiritually knitted together by the Holy Spirit. I mean, test it out. Have you ever met a believer who was a complete stranger, and you automatically you feel this connection? Have you ever done that? You ever gone like halfway around the world? I don't know, it could be in an airport. You could be hurrying to try to get some your baggage, and you bump into someone, and he has a psalm something on something on his shirt, and then you guys start talking, and yo, you're a believer, I'm a believer. Oh, man, pray. There's a connection. Doesn't matter what status, who you were, nothing. But there's a bond, didn't it? And, um, and so regardless of how the world views and labels our statuses in life, look how Paul sees them. Paul didn't see them as a slave. He didn't see them as someone very high up there. He didn't see them just a, you're a nobody, you're just a normal worker. No, Paul sees them as my beloved. My beloved. So what's the difference between beloved and just being loved? Both words are adjectives, but the, name, the main difference between the two is beloved is the more intense, it's a, it's a more of intense word for loved, okay? It's used to describe someone we love deeply and, and uh, we love more dearly. What a great reminder of God's love. What a great reminder this morning that God loves you. And I understand that sometimes many of us have heard those words before. I love you. And only to be betrayed, abandoned, um, abused, hurt. God will never do that. God has given his whole heart to you. And he will never, ever take it back. I love how, God, how Paul tries to describe it of God's love in Romans chapter 8, in verse 38. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in the Christ Christ. With, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Basically, God can't love you any more, nor can he love you any less. Isn't that good to feel? It's good to know this morning. And in Romans 16, verse 10, he continues, Paul continues, and he goes, Greet up Epilus, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Bible scholars believe that Aristobulus was the brother of Herod Agrippa and the grandson of Herod the Great. And note that Paul calls Apollos approved in Christ. What does that mean? As a believer, God looks at you and he says, you're approved meaning you got nothing to prove. It doesn't matter what you have done in the past anymore. As a believer, you're a new creature in his eyes. It's not about works or anything you can do or even anything you can give. It's all about what God has done. That's it. That's why he gets the praise. And many Christians have a hard time accepting this at times. Many times in church, we fall into the pressure of performing 
for approval of others. We need to stop looking around. Don't worry about what others think. Learn to live for an audience of one. Jesus. Learn to look up and then rest in what God says about you and his promises to you. If we get this right, this happens by itself. Your work, your relationships, um, um, your friends, whatever, is, whatever life throws at you, it'll happen by itself. It'll figure itself out. Get this right. Stay here. This will happen. You with me? Um, hear him this morning calling you that. You're my beloved and you're approved. And then in Romans uh, verse 11, 16 verse 11, Paul continues, he says, Great Herodian, greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Real quick, Herodian, it was, uh, they say he was related to the, Herod, uh, uh, to the family, Herod's family. And Narcissus, some scholars believe that he was actually the secretary of Emperor Claudius. Isn't this amazing how Christianity, all these Christians are in different places and spots around society? And then in, in verse 12, he continues and he, and he says, Greet Trufana and Trufosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved um, Perses who labored much in the Lord. So Trufana and Trufosa, possibly sisters. Their name means delicate and dainty. I, I don't know. In my mind, I'm thinking twins, you know? Not sure, but, but possibly sisters. And then we're introduced to uh, Perses, who, who means from Persia. So again, no mention of any husbands, but one thing we do see is that these women are just faithfully serving the Lord. And then we move on in, in verse 13, and he says, Greet Rufus, chosen the Lord, and his mother and mine. Now, most of the Bible scholars agree that Rufus is, uh, was one of the sons of Simon of Cyrene. Um, Simon was the man asked to carry Jesus' cross. You remember that scene? And, he, and so, look, now look what happened there. He carried that cross. Look at his, and now we see a glimpse that his family was saved through that. Seeing, seeing that, carrying his cross, seeing what happened to Jesus. His, literally, his family got saved. And here's one of his sons, Rufus. Now, he was not Paul's natural brother, nor did he have the same mother. Um, his mother would have been the wife of Simon of Cyrene. But at some point, she probably cared for Paul during his ministry travels, right? And that's why he says, hey, man, it's like you're my mom, your mom kind of a thing. Again, it's just another beautiful picture of how the church becomes a new family. And then in verse 14, Paul continues, and he says, uh, Greet Asucriticus, Phlegon, Hermas, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them greet Philologus and Julia, Nerus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet, with, greet one another with a holy kiss. The church of Christ greet you. So Paul finishes addressing the rest of the believers in Rome. And he sends them, he, he tells them with a holy kiss. So what I want everyone to do this morning is turn to your neighbor. Just kidding. We're not going to do that. If you guys don't want to be the doers of the word, you know, I'll leave that for Pastor Brian to deal with. Now, the holy kiss was a, a common custom in that day, right? Still practiced today in a lot of Middle Eastern countries and cultures. Uh, it's a greeting where you've seen it, where they just, you know, they kiss on their forehead, their cheeks, you know. It's a greeting. Um, in the United States, it could be applicable to what? Shaking hands, a fist bump, uh, the three-tap bro hug. 
now COVID kind of messed a lot of this up, but I, I think I, uh, for, you know, I'm Italian, so I'm a hugger. And I, so COVID was very hard on me. Um, <laughs> But that three tap bro hug, it's important to get right, guys. I hope you get, you know, listen, I'm gonna just talk to the guys for a second. See, when, we, when you do that, four taps is awkward. Don't, okay? Five taps, suspicious, okay? Six, now, now that's just becoming uncomfortable, all right? Two, that's insincere, it's just not sincere enough. It's three. It's a three-tap bro hug, okay? Think of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's perfect, <laughs> all right? So let's get that right. I know it's just a refresher because COVID, you know, it's been a while. So um, Paul, back, <laughs> back to Romans. Verse 17, now I urge you, brethren, note, that, uh, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and, and simple concerning evil. And the, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, I remember when my daughter first moved out and the different emotions that a parent has, okay? Um, my heart tugged, thinking, I'm going to miss those um, daily conversations at times that when we would spend together time to time. Or... Those times that we used to raid the video store, Blockbuster, you know? We would go and we would just rent a bunch of movies. And then, then of course, we would load up with junk food to make sure to get us through all those movies. It was awesome. Um, or those times of stepping on her makeup on the carpet, you know, where she would leave the mirror on the floor. I don't know what was going on over here, but I remember that. Or the daily disaster, she would leave the bathroom uh, every time she got ready for the day. But I was excited for her, watching her grow up, stepping out into the world, tackling new adventures, new responsibility. Then, like Paul, in the middle of my loving reminiscing, I suddenly feel like a, a sudden concern that would, com would come over me. But it wasn't that feeling that you get when, like, that I got when she was driving. It wasn't, it wasn't that. It was that. It was something different. You see, I started to think of the various dangers that a young woman would, would face out there on her own without me around. Uh, I would warn her, well, hey, watch out for strangers, especially those smooth talking ones. All right? Stay away from them and, and always lock your door and be careful when you're out alone. Look around, know your surroundings, right? And I see Paul doing the same thing right here. You know, as Paul's thinking about each person, his love and appreciation and gratitude for them, there's a sudden feeling of concern coming over Paul. And you see, Paul sees, um, Paul has seen the dangers of this Gentile world filled with idolatry and, and false beliefs. He's seen that. He knows that. And he wanted to make sure that they were warned of those dangers. He wanted to make sure they were prepared, that they were aware, that they would be able to protect themselves. And when Paul used that word simple to describe the believers, it didn't mean dumb. The word in the Greek means akarios, or it means pure, innocent, harmless. These believers were sincere in learning and growing and, and sharing and discussing the word of God with, with people, with those around them. And unfortunately, th there are people who try to take advantage at times of that innocence and of that love. And when someone's giving, and there's, it happens, right? And heck, Jesus advised the disciples in Matthew 10, 16. He says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. 
Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless. That's that same word, akereos. Harmless as doves. And Paul points to the first sign. Here's the flag. He says, the first sign that you, you should take note of, those who are causing division and offenses. That should be a, something should go off. You see, the church was living according to the word, right? This way. Their actions, their words, their motives were all filtered through the word of God. So any division and offenses would be evidence that something wasn't lining up right. There was something off somewhere. And Paul fervently and urgently and lovingly warns the church, be aware of one's smooth words and flattering speech. Watch for their motives. Are they being driven by their own belly, it said there, with basically their own desires or self-interest, self-gratification? And this isn't the first time we hear Paul's warning to the church. In Acts chapter 20, verse 27, Paul warns the church. He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Interesting there, right? That's a good underliner. That's why we go verse by verse to get the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And then he says, for I know this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. And he says, therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. So this danger we know, can come from, yes, the outside, but also from the inside of the church. And for time's sake, I would like to just touch on one area of caution. This could be a whole Sunday service right there, okay? But just on one area of caution. Um, today, in our world today, there are many spiritual options out there. You're seeing it. You're hearing it. They're becoming more accepted and more mainstream. The occult, astrology, modern paganism, various religious cults that we know of. And as a Christian, I understand why we would want to understand why, you know, understand why they believe and what they believe, right? I get it. Especially if we have family or friends who may have adopted some of those practices and beliefs. You know, you, you feel that we, we would need to know that information so I can better witness to them. I get it. I've done that. But all I want to do is just caution there how much time we devote ourselves in studying the false doctrines. We really don't need to know all the whys they are false. Instead, I would encourage you to use more time in studying why we believe in our truth. A good example was Jesus when he was out in the went face to face with Satan out in the out in the desert. We didn't he didn't talk to Satan about Satan. He said nothing but the word of God. He used the word of God to combat everything Satan was telling him. That was an example. We're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for what? Teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God, that's you and me, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's all there. It's all we need. We just need to know the Bible really good. We just got to know why you believe in what you believe. Um, a great example is the bank tellers. You might have heard this already. But, you know, they count all day, real money, real money, all day. They count, count, count. And then uh, they would slip in a counterfeit bill into their pile. And immediately the teller 
would be able to identify it. It just didn't feel right. It didn't look right. It just pops out. Because once you handle the truth so much, anything false is going to flag you. You'll know. That's all we need to know. It's, it's, I used to have books. for. I used to have a Bible this is my Mormon Bible. This is my Jehovah's Bible. I used to have, because in there I had all the verses where to go to, to show them all the different things. You know, the occult. You know, I would, I would be looking for their occult Bible and then try to underline things. And what? Don't need to do that. I just need to know the truth real good. If you know the truth real good, that's why we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. The whole counsel of God. Paul said that to to help you with the deception. He says, know the whole counsel of God. When you know it, You can't be deceived. And then you can coach and train and share and help people understand. Because so many of these people that I've encountered, they're just getting it wrong. They're getting things twisted. They're they're taking out of context. So much of that, they just need help. And I, I, and I, I, I pray for them and my heart goes to them because they're searching. They're seeking truth. You've got it. We have it right here. And that's what God's called us to do, you know? Focus on the Word of God. Be a student. Be proficient. Be an expert in the Word of God. The Bereans, right? They verified everything they would hear by only using one source of truth, the Bible, the Scriptures. In Acts 17, 11, in speaking of the Bereans, it said that they received the Word with all readiness, and then what did they do? They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They would hear it, and then they would go right to their scriptures and make sure it's confirmed and verified. Paul reminds the church of the big picture then at the end there. Did you catch that? The blessed hope for us all. This evil, this deception that we have to deal with in this world, these satanic attacks... They're all going to end. It's only for a short time. It says our God of peace, it says, will crush Satan like one crushes a bug under his foot. That's what it says. I added a little bit, but (laughs) you get it. Verse 21, Timothy, he says, back in Romans 16, right? Timothy, he says, my fellow worker and Lucius, uh, Jason and Sospiter, my countrymen, greet you. And Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartus, a brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So here's a second group of believers um, are those who are currently with Paul in Corinth. So this is his posse right now. They're here with him, okay? Um, And the church was meeting at Gaius' house. Um, Interesting note, uh, Gaius was one of the two people whom Paul baptized with his own hand. We we read that in other scripture. Um, Tertius was like Paul's secretary in a way. He wrote wrote the letter as Paul dictated it, right? Um, For millennials, it's uh, it's the, this was the original, this was called talk, to Tertius, uh, that's where we get the word talk to text today. <laughs> Don't write that down. I made that up, but it was, I thought it was funny. We see Timothy was with him there. We know Timothy, um, who also received a couple of letters from Paul, um, one which is the last letter before Paul's death. Um, and then Paul seems to be having a hard time ending this letter, right? I mean, this is the second amen now. Um, and then he goes into verse 25 of chapter 16. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, uh, or to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So Paul ends the letter 
to the church of Rome, the book of Romans. Um, and you know what? That church is very much like our church. Not much has changed. Did you notice that as they were reading through this letter, we call it, it's a letter, but we call it the book of Romans, everyone was listening as they went through it, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, just like we did for a few weeks. This was a church made up of men and women, married, single, widowed, young, old, working or retired, right? That's my modern day application for slave and free. <laughs> Come on, you know the truth of that. R rich and poor, Various nationalities and backgrounds, a lot of diversity. No difference in us today. It's the same church. But one thing we all have in common with that church, with our church, with one another, is that there was a unity around Jesus Christ. A unity established with faithfulness, obedience to him. And this thing called church this gathering of believers, this body of Christ, this spiritual family. It's called a mystery since the beginning of time. A mystery revealed through us, erasing the differences of Jew and Gentile. The mystery of uniting all of mankind, all of nations, is given to us. At the heart of that mystery is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says in, in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which had been hidden from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And so we end Romans this morning the way we started the book of Romans, with another key verse. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and then also for the Greek. This is our calling, church. That is our purpose, why we gather. To share God's message of love, mercy, Grace, forgiveness, eternal life to a lost world. You have been given that to do that. And I will end this morning with a quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He had a classic book called Life Together. And in there, he talks about the church. And he says, a Christian community is unlike any other community because of this unique bond a bond that exists between each of us through Christ. When Jesus is at the center of our fellowship, the world is radically transformed. So may the church be a relationship among fellows, a fellowship bound not by ethnicity, social class, or status, but by the redeeming power of Christ at work in us, through the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, let that be our prayer, Lord, that we may live out the words of your word through our lives, that we would be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, that we would live in unity with you, Lord, as well as our brother and sisters of the church. Build our lives in such a way that brings glory to you, Lord. Use our witness of you, Lord, to radically transform our world around us today, Father.
Thank you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.